concert series, Arts Active, and St. David's Hall. I'd like to, to welcome you to that annex of St. David's Hall you probably haven't seen before, my study. Today, my name is Keith Chapin. Uh, I'm a lecturer at Cardiff University School of Music. And I would like to talk a little bit about something which is very obvious to most of us. Uh, that is, that music is incredibly important to our well-being. This is something which goes without saying, but it's also been the subject of much research recently. I am not going to go into this research, however. What I would like to do instead is to go back in time, to go back and think about how people in the past have talked about this issue of the importance that music has for making us feel at home in the world. Um, this is something that goes well back before the time of the word of well-being. Um, uh, I actually, as in, in preparation for this, I actually looked at the Oxford English Dictionary and discovered the fun fact that the word, word well-being actually first entered uh, the English vocabulary, or at least the first recorded instance of it, uh, in around 1521, when an Englishman translated a Renaissance book on uh, how to be the, a, a good courtier at court. and. Um, I'm not sure if I wanted to say too much about this, but I thought it was interesting. Um, the, the translation noted that it was important for uh, men that uh, women exist, not only for their being, but also for their well-being. As I say, this is a fun fact. I'm not sure what to do with it. I will leave it to you to mull over in your, your spare time. In any ways, to come back to the issue of well-being, it is of course something that was important to people uh, well before this word entered the English vocabulary. Um, and what I want to do in particular is think about types of musical connections that people perceived. Um, and in doing so, I'd like to look at a very um, odd place, actually, a notion, a rather metaphysical notion, that there is a link between the harmony in the world, the harmony in our soul, and sounding music. As a first step towards this, I'd like to take a look at uh, a text of music theory, actually, written by one Giuseppe Sarlino uh, in 1588. It's called The Institutions of Harmony. And Sarlino did a really good job of actually coming to terms with certain uh, principles of musical composition that existed in the Renaissance. Uh, his text became a model for um, th theorists and pedagogues for centuries thereafter. But the principles that he was looking at was basically thinking about how parts can harmonize together. Um, he was very much interested in certain perfect intervals, uh, like a fourth, a fifth, an octave. Um, and he was thinking about how these things form a type of foundation to musical technique. Um, but these perfect intervals were more than just intervals, sounding you know, good sounds. They were also principles that he saw at work in the universe as, 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 a, as a whole. And when he referred to this, he referred back to a very ancient notion, uh, one that often, was as often associated with Pythagoras, the, the Greek uh, mathematician uh, known best today for the Pythagorean theorem, but who was very much known in antiquity for a belief that mathematical principles underpinned the world as a whole. So just to give you a taste of this, um, I'll note, I'll, I'll, I'll quote a little bit from the Institutions of Harmony, Harmony, where Tarlino says, the writings of ancient philosophers make it clear how much music was celebrated and held to be sacred. The Pythagoreans in particular believed that the world was composed musically and that the heavens caused harmony in the revolutions and that our soul is formed according to the same laws and that it is awakened and its powers vivified by songs and instrumental music. So again, this is a notion that there's certain musical harmonies that underpin not only the world, um, but also our souls and the music that we hear. This same notion uh, finds multiple expressions. Uh, and before I, I give you a musical example, uh, I want to just give you an image to associate with this, one that is very, very strange when one first looks at it, but encapsulates very well this notion of a type of link between musical sounds and cosmic harmony. Um, what you see here before you 
is an engraving from the book by Robert Flood, um, a Rosicrucian and uh, rather speculative thinker, let's say, um, from the early 17th century. It's, the book is called uh, The History of the Two Worlds uh, in the English. And that the, in particular, in this particular case, he's, he's looking at the, this harmony between the world as a whole and sounding music. And what you see here is um, the hand of God at the very top, who's tuning a musical instrument. And this is not a musical instrument that you'd actually hear in everyday life. You're not going to go to St. David's Hall and hear a monochord performance. Uh, the instrument, as I said, is the monochord. It was an instrument that uh, mathematicians, music theorists used for measuring intervals. It was as much an instrument of physics as it was of music. And overlaid upon that, you can see uh, a rather speculative uh, picture of the movements of the, the spheres, the movements of the planets with the sun in the center. Uh, essentially, what people got very excited about was that if you take a musical string and you divide it exactly in half, so a ratio of one to two, you get a sound which is an octave higher than the string as a whole. This is a principle which underpins any stringed instrument. So for instance, if you play a violin, you stop it halfway up the string, you get an octave higher. Similarly, if you were to stop the string two thirds along its length, so you, you, and you pluck the smaller side, you're going to get a sound which is one-fifth the length of the, of the string as a whole. Um, so um, the, this ratio, two to three, underpins the perfect interval of the perfect fifth. Three to four would then be the perfect fourth. And after that, the mathematics gets a bit dodgy. But nonetheless, um, mathematicians, uh, music theorists, and metaphysicians got very excited about the fact that there was this type of numerical purity to these perfect these intervals. And they read into that a type of metaphysical significance, that this musical sounds was in some ways uh, an expression of fundamental mathematical principles. And those fundamental mathematical principles underpin the world as a whole. Um, to get a sense of what they were uh, attaching to this to in terms of music, I'd like to play uh, a mass by Josquin de Pré, the Missa Bonnone Sextitoni, which was written around 1500. Uh, it was written well before uh, Zarlino's treatise on harmony, but it, um, in many ways Zarlino was codifying principles that underpinned Josquin's music. Um, and what I'd like you to hear in particular at the very beginning, first of all, just the purity of the sound, it is extremely beautiful. Um, but also the way that there's the, um, that you hear a particular motive um, uh, which comes back. And so you hear it at the very beginning and then very quickly thereafter, another voice imitates it at a slightly different interval. A little bit later on, another voice comes in with that same opening motive and then another one again. The distance between those opening motives is that of a fourth or a fifth these perfect intervals. So the purity of sound here is seen as in some ways um, a, a, a manifestation of those mathematical principles. And the sound kind of was the proof that people had that somehow this made sense. So um, I will play a little bit of Josquin's Missalonais Ne Sixtitone, the Kyrie, uh, in a recording by the, uh, the, the Talus scholars under the direction of Peter Phillips.
So that again was the Kyrie, uh, the very first Kyrie from Josquin de Pré's Missa Lomé Amé Sextitoni. Um, this harmony, uh, as I said, roots back in a Pythagorean tradition. And um, as I said before, there's a type of link between three different levels according to various versions of this Pythagorean tradition. Pythagoras himself didn't leave any writings at all. Uh, and so what we know of this Pythagorean tradition, uh, we know from various scraps of writing from antiquity. And I suppose the advantage of not having any uh, direct source uh, coming from Pythagoras is that the people who uh, bought into this Pythagorean tradition could basically make of it what they wished. Um, but um, in one very influential account, that of uh, a sixth century uh, Roman named Boethius, someone who got involved in a bit of palace intrigue uh, and was uh, exiled and spent his time writing about philosophy, but also wrote a book about music. Um, he uh, came up, uh, thought that there were three different levels to this tradition. Um, there was musica mundana, or music of the spheres, musica humana, music of the human body and soul, and musica instrumentalis, or sounding music. And you see various pictures here uh, on the right uh, from Boethius's treatise on, um, the, on music. And you can see that he was interested in these, these perfect principles, and he wished to give them some sort of visual exemplification. So this went beyond just sounds. It was also went into some things where people saw certain shapes or certain forms associated with it. Um, and here, um, what you can actually see is that this sense of harmony was so important that people thought about all the different ways that people could feel in harmony with their world. Music was particularly important for them, but it was also something that they found in architecture and in other shapes as well. Um, so if you one thinks about this principle of harmony as in essence expressing a real desire on people to feel a sense of proportion in their world, and more than that, a sense of belonging, that somehow the, their uh, inner motions, their spirit, was in some ways uh, proportionate or in harmony with the world around them. You can find numerous expressions of this idea. Um, Vitruvius was a first century architect, actually, who believed that musical principles underpinned the, the shapes of architecture. Um, Boethius, the person I mentioned a second ago, who wrote about uh, the theory of music, uh, used Vitruvius actually as one of his uh, sources. Um, if you move, move much further forward, you can see some very famous expressions of this, this, this notion that there's a, a fundamental harmony or a sense of proportion uh, to our world. Uh, one of them, the most famous one, is perhaps Leonardo da Vinci's uh, drawing, uh, which is often entitled uh, the Vitruvian Man, a reference to Vitruvius. And you can see that he was uh, interested in showing that there's a real sense of proportion to the human body. Um, an architect, a very famous architect from the 7th, 16th century, Andrea Palladio, who worked around Venice in particular, uh, thought that these principles were extremely important for architecture. And from Palladio, he, he drew upon Vitruvius in part. Um, he developed a style of architecture that was incredibly influential, way beyond the Renaissance, the time of his, his, his building. So in the top right, you see uh, a picture of the Villa Foscari, built between 1558 and 1560, somewhere near Venice. Uh, but in the bottom right, those of you uh, in South Wales uh, might recognize the Guild Hall at Carmarthen, built sometime between 1767 and 1777, according to plans by Sir Robert Taylor. Um, in both cases, there's a sense of proportion uh, that is incredibly important for underpinning these, bu these, these buildings. So the next time that you're in the square in front of the Guildhall at Camarthen, you start to hear strange sounds emanating from the sky. You can, you can take a pause for a minute and just enjoy the music of the spheres, the, the harmony of the spheres coming down to you as you admire the harmony uh, before you in the building of Robert Taylor. So 
again, this is a real uh, sense of proportion that people were looking for, and they, they sought various artistic expressions of it, musical, architectural, um, one could go on very far. Um, however, I want to talk about music today, so I'm going to move forward a couple of centuries to um, J.S. Bach, um, because one thing that's quite interesting is that with the 17th century, people started to be somewhat suspicious of the metaphysical speculation that you know, made you think, well, if you can divide a string in half and you get a, a perfect octave, um, that's, a, that's a good sign that you can, uh, that there's a, that same harmony, uh, that same proportion underpinning the movement of the spheres. People started to become a little bit suspicious of that. They were more uh, interested in empirical approaches to the sciences. However, this notion of harmony um, and the way that it links uh, the human spirit with the, the, the world around one remained very strong and it kind of channeled its way through music history in various ways. Uh, J.S. Bach uh, uh, belonged to a very late manifestation of this. And one can see this actually in the, in the preface or the, the title pages of some of his most uh, well-known works. So uh, Bach in general was a composer. He didn't write much about uh, musical debates. But from these various signs, one can see that he was actually quite, quite uh, keyed into them. He, quite, he really followed what was going on around him at the time. Uh, and because he was such a prominent composer in northern Germany, uh, people tended to try to um, involve him in these debates. So um, in, I guess what I'm going to do first is first just read you the preface to the Well-Tempered Clavier, um, uh, which is seems really, really odd at first. It seems quite abstract. Um, and I'll, I'll then explain what he's referring to. So what Bach, this is the, the manuscript you see on the left. It's a manuscript copy of the, of the Well-Tempered Clavier, the first book um, from 1722. And what is written on this, the title page of this manuscript copy uh, is the Well-Tempered Clavier, or Preludes and Fugues Through All the Tones and Semitones, both as regards the Tertium major, Majorum, or Re Mi, and Tertium Minorum, or Re Mi Fa, for the profit and use of the studious musical young, and also for the special diversion of those who are already skillful in the study, composed and made by jo Johann Sebastian Bach, for the time being Kapellmeister and director of the chamber music of the Prince of Anhalt Kirtum in the year 1722. So this seems to be a quite wordy uh, introduction to a piece of music. Uh, it's, to a certain extent, that was the style of the time. But the reference to solemnization syllables, or solfege syllables, as they're often known today, ut re mi, or re mi fa, that would be um, c, d, e in the first case, and re mi fa, d, e, f, um, is a reference to the importance that Bach attached to traditional music theory. Uh, in many ways, what he is doing here is he's responding to a, a, a musical uh, tiff between uh, a, a publicist, an early music publicist who lived in Hamburg, someone named Johann Mattesen, and other music theorists um, who were like Bach, often organists, and uh, worked for the musical establishment of Northern Germany. Johann Mattesen was a kind of breath from the future. He translated Addison and Steele, for instance, for some of the early uh, moral weeklies in Germany. Um, but he uh, really took a, a, a dim view of traditional music theory, in particular type of music theory that linked musical facts with uh, co cosmological speculation. And along with this entire version of music theory, he he rejected the language that it used as well. In particular, these syllables, ut re mi, or the do re mi, or c, d, e. Um, and he engaged in a lengthy diatribe with various music theorists about that shortly before uh, 1722. So it seems quite likely that Bach, in invoking this language of ut re mi, that is c, d, e, to talk about a major third, uh, the, the interval between a C and an E, um, 
that Bach was actually referring to this particular debate. So it seems that Bach had a type of respect for this theoretical but also speculative tradition. Um, at the same time, this speculative tradition had a type of um, theological significance for him that worked its way not only into religious music, but also into so-called so secular music. So in this particular work, the Well-Tempered Clavier, Bach refers to the use of this music for the studious musical young. In part, there were pieces that he had written for his own sons to learn the art of composition. But he also refers to the special diversion of those who are already skillful in the study. And the word of diversion here is interesting because it, it brings up an idea about what type of pleasure one gets from this music. If one looks to another piece, uh, the, the clavier exercises, the clavier üben, um, there's a couple of different volumes of these things. Some pieces are for organ, sometimes they're for other keyboards like harpsichord. The very first volume um, is, you see on your right-hand side, it's clavier übung, uh, or clavier ex uh, exercises for the keyboard, consisting in preludes, allemands, courants, sarabands, jigs, minuets, and other gallantries. And this is what the next part is very interesting. It is produced for the lovers of music, for the entertainment of their spirit, so in gemüts ergötzen, is the word he uses, so gemüts ergötzen, or the entertainment of the spirit. And what Bach is referring to here is not just a notion that, that the music provides some sort of um, light pleasure, um, but that there is a type of special spiritual pleasure to this. And in this respect, Bach is linking into a Lutheran tradition that in many ways is translating this long Pythagorean tradition. So for instance, he talks about um, the, the refined, the pleasure of the spirit uh, that you can receive from even these, these gallantries, things like alamans, currants, cerebrans, shigs. And here, Bach is flipping into a slightly different uh, di debate about music. And he's responding in many ways to conservative Lutheran pastors who were very suspicious of dancing, um, because dancing and music might lead to gambling instead. Uh, and you know, who knows what other um, vices that might follow along from, from listening to music. And what Bach is, is, is saying is actually these pieces uh, offer a type of pleasure to the spirit, which is innocent of, of these vices that were, were attributed to it by strict Lutheran pastors. Um, and in particular, they were, they were innocent of them because they, they tuned the soul in a way that was very similar to this, what was thought of in this Pythagorean tradition, that in some ways this music was uh, a type of sounding theology. This was a term that Martin Luther used to talk about music. Um, so Bach, a good strict Lutheran, looked back to Martin Luther, who was a very practiced musician himself. And Martin Luther actually even looked back to Josquin, a composer that we heard just a few minutes ago. So, in order for us to get a little bit of uh, entertainment for the spirit, I'd like to play uh, segments of the first two pieces from the Well-Tempered Clavier. They are very well known, but I think what I want to focus on here is the way that they too are programmatically uh, developing this, these very simple intervals or very simple musical uh, features. So uh, in many ways, if you're a writer of keyboard music, uh, there are a couple of things you could do to organize your music at this time. Um, uh, one of them was to develop chords. Another one was to develop short themes. You could then uh, use them in imitation of each other, as in a fugue. And another one was to use dance rhythms. These are the three basic ways that an, a composer of instrumental music at this time could organize their music. Um, and the, the very first two pieces, a prelude, first of all, develops a type of chordal texture, which really emphasizes this type of purity of sound. And the fugue, which immediately comes after, has more of a melodic approach, so harmony, melody, harmony in the chords of the prelude, and then a melodic approach, simple themes, which are then imitated between different voices in the keyboard in the same way that we heard in the Joscan a few minutes ago. 
where an initial motive in one voice is imitated by a voice in another one. So enough talk. Uh, let me play a little bit of the prelude in C major for your entertainment of the spirit. And so forth. Um, so for those of you who uh, feel like that your spirit has been entertained, um, uh, I'm sure that you will very much agree with Bach that those Lutheran pastors were wrong. Um, if you hearing this music has all of a sudden created you the urge to turn to online gambling, uh, well, maybe Bach was wrong and the, those strict Lutheran pastors were correct. Uh, in any case, uh, for those of you who have stayed with me, and not move to online gambling, I'd like to move forward a step uh, to Beethoven. Uh, because this empirical tendency that when I, I mentioned before was of course really important. You know, people couldn't ignore the fact that the, those musical uh, harmonies uh, didn't really quite add up to the proportions that people saw or the measurements that people were making of the stars and the heavens and stuff like that. Um, at the same time, this idea that there was some sort of link between inner harmony and outer harmony remained extremely powerful, at least as an artistic principle, but also as a philosophical principle as well. So for instance, um, uh, at the very end of the 18th century, Immanuel Kant um, wrote a number of books about that were basically trying to define human consciousness, uh, try to think about how people should live their lives according to principles of reason, and also think about how judgment work, including artistic judgment. Um, one of Kant's most famous statements was one that was picked up by Beethoven, actually. Uh, Immanuel Kant wrote in the Critique of Practical Reason in 1788, um, in a somewhat 
poetic, uh, out of character turn of phrase, uh, two things fill the mind with ever new and more increasing admiration and awe. The more often and steadily we reflect upon them, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. So in some ways, what people were focusing here was less on the fact of some sort of harmony in the, in the universe or harmony within, but rather the, the subjective experience, how people feel when they look at the starry heavens or how people uh, feel when they think about the, the, the moral beings that, you know, that exists within us. Um, morality is incredibly important in these values. Um, so when they talk about the starry heavens above me, what they're focusing on is less is the, the proportion between the different stars as they move around, but just the fact that the sheer multitude overwhelms us, that it seems sublime to man for that reason, that it overwhelms our imagination. Similarly, people looked at the fact that human beings could make moral choices that would even um, bring them to death. You know, people would decide to do things in a war or in a difficult situation that could endanger themselves, their physical being. And that ability of human uh, beings to make moral choices that were endangering themselves was something that similarly just astounded, astonished people, overwhelmed their imagination. Uh, the term of the time was the sublime, the sublimity. Um, and this was something that was incredibly important to artists at the time. Uh, Beethoven actually took this phrase from Kant and actually jotted it down in one of his, his notebooks. Um, and one can see also from the various plays that Beethoven was um, set music to, he would sometimes write incidental music to plays, um, that he was very much attuned to the, the uh, intense thought that people were devoting to this inner sublimity of moral choices, uh, in addition, to, as he was also attentive to the, um, the experience of the world around him, the, the heavens, but also nature as a whole. Um, to give you one sense of this, um, this type of attachment to these, these principles of the sublime, I'd like to play one of his, um, for me, most sublime pieces of music, the slow movement from the string quartet, Opus 132, the string quartet in A minor. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Beethoven had been recovering from an illness, and he wrote this piece as a type of uh, hymn of thanksgiving. Um, it's, um, he entitles it actually, uh, A Holy Song of Thanksgiving to the Divinity in the Lydian Mode. And what's quite interesting about this is that Beethoven also reaches back to an older tradition of music, uh, in very much actually the same tradition that Bach had been making, thinking about. Uh, shortly before this, Beethoven had actually been doing work in the archives, in the Imperial Archives in Vienna, um, as he worked on his major mass, the Missa Solemnis, and was checking out scores by Palestrina and other Renaissance composers. And in this particular case, you see Beethoven trying to achieve the same type of spiritual calm in, in music that he heard and many that he heard and also many of his contemporaries heard in older music. So it's not quite um, what Josquin or Palestrina, another Renaissance composer, would have written. But it seems to be trying to capture that same uh, sonic world in which there's a type of musical harmony which has some larger implications to it. And this is a recording by the Takash Quartet. Uh, the recording of Bach that you heard a second ago uh, was by Till Fellner, an Austrian pianist.
So in this case, Beethoven was using in many ways the same types of techniques that Bach and Joska had been using. So that type of imitative texture that seemed to reflect some sort of um, purity of, of interval that was uh, for, at one time had been associated with um, the, the purity of the universe as a whole. In Beethoven's case, however, he seems to be very much in, um, interested in a type of inner experience of this thing. So what's actually interesting about this particular movement is it goes back and forth between two different types of textures. This one, which is in many ways a type of uh, ver Beethovenian, both Beethovenian version of a hymn, and then another one which has a much more of a lilt to it. Uh, it's almost like a minuet like that, but a very, very elaborate one. Beethoven actually labels it in his score, feeling new strength. So he moves back and forth between a type of devotional attitude and uh, a type of representation of the new strength that one gets from that. Um, I'll leave that to, to you to listen to in, in, your, own, uh, in your spare time. Um, and I'd like to move forward another 30 years or so to, to Brahms and his particular musical context. And here I'd like to show you once again that this notion of this this Pythagorean notion is still very strong, even if people uh, had doubts about its scientific accuracy. So uh, before we listen to some Brahms, um, I want to read a section of a, of a treatise on, on musical aesthetics that was incredibly influential in the end of the 19th century. It was written by a Viennese music critic who later became a professor of music at the University of Vienna, someone named Eduard Hanslick. And it was called From Musikale Schönen, or On the Musically Beautiful. And in many ways, this book is a type of critique of some of the tendencies in contemporary music that Hanslick saw around him in, around, in the 1850s. In particular, he didn't like Liszt. He didn't like Wagner. Uh, later on, he didn't like Bruckner very much. He didn't like Tchaikovsky very much either. Um, and what he was interested in is a, t a certain sense of poise, I think, actually, um, but also a type of music in which you feel like the different elements of the music are in some ways in harmony with each other. I think that he, he found the music of these other composers a bit too aggressive at times, although I think he was somewhat, um, somewhat blind to the, the wonderful qualities of these other composers. Um, I'm going to read you an extended passage from his treatise on the musically beautiful um, first, and then turn to a piece by Brahms. So Hanslick writes, music is the presentation of the beautiful in tones. The content and object of music is therefore, first and foremost, the musically beautiful. The essence of this cannot be further explained or defined. That's convenient. Uh, it manifests itself directly to the human spirit as beauty in that it penetrates to the center of the mind in sounding tonal form. Transmitted, transmitted through the sense of hearing. So basically, musical sounds uh, speak directly to one and have a, a type of beauty to them. At the very end of the treatise, Hanslick goes on to talk about the metaphysical side of this. So I continue. In the psyche of the listener, this intellectual spiritual substance unites the beautiful in music with all other great and beautiful ideas. It is not merely and absolutely to its own intrinsic beauty that music affects the listener, but rather at the same time as a sounding image of the great motions of the universe. Through profound and secret connections to nature, the meaning of tones elevates itself high above the tones themselves, allowing us to feel at the same time the infinite in works of human talent. Just as the elements of music, sound, tone, rhythm, loudness, softness, are found throughout the entire universe, so does one find anew in music the entire universe. Um, it's quite convenient, as I said, that Hanslick uh, says that these are secret connections, even though they're very profound. Uh, and you know, he's he's he he is very aware that these are he's being quite speculative here. And actually, in later versions of this this treatise on the musical aesthetics, he actually leave, leaves out. The last part of this paragraph uh, about the secret connections with the rest of the universe. But it seems like it's a very fundamental part of his approach to music. And I think it's 
it's a way that he actually is very much aware about how music kind of makes one feel at home. Um, that there is a sense of proportion that one can feel through listening to music. Um, as I said, he liked certain composers and certain didn't. He didn't like other composers. Sometimes I think that there were, he was blind to the, the positive value of many composers. I'm a huge fan of Tchaikovsky. I love Wagner. Um, but to a certain extent, I think he was also uh, interested in a certain type of music that has a certain poise to it. And to give you just an example of this, I want to give you uh, an example of a piece by uh, Johannes Brahms. Uh, I want to give you a piece of vocal music this time, just to show that this idea of the musical beautiful, musically beautiful is not just about connect, connections between phrases or between intervals. Um, this is a piece uh, that Brahms actually dedicated to a very close friend of his, uh, Joseph, Joach Joseph Joachim, uh, one of the viol top violinists at the time, and also the violinist that premiered Brahms' violin concerto. At the time, uh, Joachim was, was having uh, marital difficulties, uh, and Brahms wrote these two songs as a way to kind of remind his friend of the, the, the love that his, his wife had for him, uh, Joachim was a very jealous person and had some unfounded suspicions. Uh, and Joach Brahms took the part of Joachim's uh, wife in trying to convince Joachim to, to stick to the marriage. So uh, we'll hear a bit of, basically a bit of marriage counseling right now. It's an absolutely beautiful uh, piece called Geistliches Wiegenlied, Spiritual Lullaby. It's the second of this, these two songs. And we're going to hear a wonderful recording with Jesse Norman um, singing uh, Daniel Berenbaum playing the piano, and also there's a viola um, uh, accompanying as well. And just to put us in the right mood, uh, this is also a Christmas tune. It's based on an, uh, a very, very old Christmas tune. So uh, it's called Spiritual Lullaby of Geistliches Wiegenlied. Um, it's basically about, it's a lullaby about a child who's sleeping and being swayed by the wind and the danger that that brings. And, a plea to the angels to to still the the trees from their swaying. So, I don't know if you heard um, the, the movement of the universe in those tones, but this is the type of music that Hanslick looked to uh, when he was looking for an exemplification of the proper type of music, according to him. You can see in front of you a caricature from a contemporary Viennese magazine in which Hanslick is waving uh, an incense becker in front of a statue of bronze. So, uh, we turn to the 20th century right now. Uh, another composer that who saw himself in this particular tradition was Paul Hindemith. Hindemith is an interesting composer because he started off as a type of um, musical bad boy, an enfant terrible expressionist, trying to shock everyone he could uh, with some really brash 
music from the 1920s. You see him here playing actually a viola d'amore, an older instrument. Uh, but he was a very uh, a, a virtuoso violist. Um, and you know, in some ways, that choice of the viola shows the degree to which he was trying to do things a little bit differently. But because he was uh, had this reputation of a mu mu being a musical bad boy, he had gone into trouble with the Nazis uh, when the Nazis started to take over in the 30s. Uh, for a while, he tried to make do in Germany because he thought that the Nazis would fall from power quickly. But eventually, he uh, was forced to emigrate. And one of the things he did, as actually as political difficulties in increased during the his time in Germany, was he started to, um, you know, take a look at music theory again. And he actually came very close to principles that we found we found expressed by Josca by Salino several hundred years before. Uh, he wrote um, a series of composition handbooks called the Craft of Musical Composition which are the result of these, and in some ways are a type of counterpoint, counterpart to Zarlino's Institutions of Harmony, written in the 16th century. Uh, I've taken a quote here to show uh, Paul Hindemith's um, devotion to this notion of a type of harmony that is manifested in the world around us, that connects us, our souls, and also our, the music we hear as well. I've taken a quote actually from a somewhat later book, not the craft of musical composition, but from a series of lectures that Paul Hindemith did in the United States in 1949 and 1950. Uh, these were later published in his book called A Composer's World. And here, Hindemith writes, uh, uh, reflecting on some of the things he had just written, we have already seen how time and space have their musical equivalents. And there apparently exist similar equivalents to basic laws in the physical sciences. This could lead us to the belief that there is some sound foundation in the ancient idea of a universe regulated by musical laws, or to be more modest, a universe whose laws of construction and operation are complemented by a spiritual reflection in musical organisms. Hindemith goes on, it is an alluring idea to think of reorganization of scientific concepts on a musical basis. Instead of a plan for the world's destruction by superbombs, a blueprint of music theory would be drawn up to serve as a plan for a tremendous reformulation of the universe. Harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic laws, as worked out in the most beautiful and exalted composition, would transform the world's woes and falsehoods into the ideal habitat for human beings. Who? by the same process of musical ennoblement, would have grown into creatures worthy of such a paradise. I think at the very least, Hindemith's idea that a mu work of music can transform humanity uh, so that they think less about atomic bombs and more about music is a, is a bit optimistic. But nonetheless, it was a very important notion for him at a time when his own music seemed to be losing relevance. His music was banned by the Nazis in 1936. And in 1938, he was uh, included in a, in a very famous exhibition of, of degenerate music and degenerate art that went around Germany. So this search for musical connection in musical sounds and in the universe as a whole is in some ways Paul Hindemith's response to the social difficulties that sound, he saw around him. He had always been a very engaged musician and a socially engaged musician. And as he found his opportunities for social engagement around him fall apart, he devoted himself to a different type of engagement, one with the music of the universe as a whole. And one can find this actually expressed musically in a number of compositions he wrote from the mid-30s onwards. So he started off very much as a musical bad boy, as I say. It's very brash, often very dissonant music. In the 1930s, he set about on a project to write sonatas and chamber music for all the instruments. He really wanted to just give people music to play. And his idea, I think, was not just to continue a tradition of, of music making, but also to allow people to feel some of the sense of connection and uh, pleasure just in the play of sounds around them. So I'm gonna give you a piece of music which I find very, very gorgeous, very, very beautiful. 
It's a quartet, actually, for clarinet, violin, cello, and piano. Uh, so a quartet for clarinet, violin, cello, and piano. Strange combination. Um, but it's, um, it's got a real sense of just uh, melancholy grace to it, I believe. And I think it, it, it's, uh, it does a really good job of showing the way that Hindemith tried to turn to a type of music that had a type of harmonic um, beauty to it that could give one him solace in a time of incredible stress. Uh, the piece was written in 1938. And so forth. Um, and for those of you who would like to hear more of Hindemith's music that was written in this vein, I encourage you to listen to pieces like the Oboe Sonata, or the Clarinet Sonata, or the Sonata for English Horn. Uh, he went, he really went through all the instruments and tried to write for each one of them. Um, so it's it's a quite special type of music. Um, to close, I'd like to turn to a very surprising direction for this particular tradition. We've looked here and a number of composers who often found that they themselves had sort of some sort of connection to this Pythagorean tradition. Um, and also composers that, um, where there were their ideas clipped into this Pythagorean tradition. Uh, but what's quite interesting is most of them were dealing in the classical tradition, often one where there's a type of musical sophistication in which parts are interacting with each other. Uh, and they found that that interaction of parts, that harmony between parts, was very important for that manifestation of a harmony in the world itself and a harmony in the soul. However, this particular Pythagorean notion is not limited to classical music. Uh, you can see that in this record cover from the Ameri Anthology of American Folk Music, which was edited by Harry Smith uh, in 1952. Uh, the picture here you see is, a, is an image of the CD reissue of it. Um, but you might recognize the image on the cover that accompanied this, these records when they came out in 1952. That's right. It's Robert Flood's monochord, divine monochord, with a god tuning at the very top, and the picture of the heavens as a whole. Um, the, the music, however, was very, very different. And I'm not sure that Josquin, uh or anyone else in this tradition would uh, agree with Harry Smith in seeing the music of American folk music as part of this tradition. Um, but this was very important to Harry Smith. He was someone who had uh, an interest in esoteric philosophy and uh, very eclectic philosophical interests. So Harry Smith, uh, writing about this, these, this anthology some years later, or actually, I'm sorry, he, he was speaking in an interview some years later he said to the interviewer, I felt social change would result from it. I'd been reading Plato's Republic. He'd been jabbering about music, how you have to be careful about changing the music because it might upset or destroy the government. Everybody gets out of step. You are not to arbitrarily change it. 
because you may undermine the empire state building without knowing it. Of course, I thought it would do that. I imagined it as having some kind of social force for good. So the fundamental notion here that there is some sort of harmony between music, sounding music, the music of the soul, of the human body, and the world around one is there. It's very, very important. Most of the music we've been listening to has been trying to emphasize uh, the way that people can feel that connection more, more strongly. I think Harry Smith wanted that sense of connection as well, but he also wanted to uh, ignite that sense of connection in people so that they would feel the type of um, social cohesion that he felt was missing at that time. So there was a type of political uh, edge to this music. But the music that he saw there was a very different type of music. So uh, to close, I'm going to play you a tune um, from, the very, from the fourth volume of this six, six uh, record collection of, of in the anthology of American folk music. It's Memphis Shakedown, a very different version of Pythagorean harmony. Memphis Shakedown by the Memphis Jug Band. Um, just as a concluding remark, uh, I think that this last song can actually teach us something about this tradition of music connecting us with the world. Uh, for much of time, people connected certain types of music or certain styles of music with, uh, um, with the notion that music could connect people with the world around them. But I think Harry Smith is very perceptive, actually, in recognizing that almost any type of music can put us in touch with the world around us in a very special way, uh, can give us a sense of proportion, a sense of well-being. Um, one doesn't need to look to Bach. One doesn't need to look to Hindemith or Josquin. Um, those people thought that that music did suit them and that it would people put, give that people that sense of connection, that sense of well-being. Harry Smith felt that American folk music could do that. So I'd like to urge you just at the very end of this to take a moment to think about what music makes you feel happy, which gives you that sense of connection. And when you're listening to it, maybe listen to see if there's any tones coming down from the heavens, any celestial sounds that make you feel a little bit better about the world. Thank you very much.